It is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Brian Kelly. Dr. Keller received his medical degree from Hahnemann University School of Medicine. He completed neurology residence at Mount Sinai Medical Center in New York, in New York and neurophysiology fellowship at UMDNJ Robert Wood Johnson. Dr. Kelly is a division chief of neurology at Brandywine Hospital at Tower Health Systems. Dr. Kelly will be talking today about recognition and management of headache syndromes. Dr. Kelly. Good morning. Can you see me and hear me now? Yes. Wonderful. So it's a pleasure to meet you all and speak with you all in this uh, virtual environment that we're in these days. Um, I am pleased to be talking about headaches. And uh, I would like to say that headaches are probably one of the most ubiquitous things that are going to be presented to a neurologist's practice. You know, it's funny, we, we, we learn about headaches during our training in association with a variety of conditions, subarachnoid so hemorrhage and the classical worst headache of your life. But the reality is headaches are present in so many different conditions. And it's important to be able to recognize when they are benign or when they are significant. So we have, as I said, headaches being ubiquitous. There's probably no one listening right now who has not suffered a headache. And I'll be willing to venture that significant number of the audience suffer from rather severe headache syndromes. So there are certain rules to try to help assess and treat a headache syndrome. Understanding how to treat headaches will be one of your real opportunities to make a difference in the quality of someone's life and in the serious headache syndromes to actually save their lives. So I would like to present to you a brief overview of different types of headache syndromes. Each one of these headache syndromes in and of themselves could be a lecture. So we're not going to go into great detail on each one of them, but rather help you to categorize and classify the headaches and have a general understanding of the approach so the primary headache syndromes are those that are commonly occurring, usually not associated with disease states. And the secondary headache syndromes are often associated with a variety of disease states, which I will categorize in the latter part of my talk. There are general rules in recognizing a headache so that you can understand the type of headache it is and how to approach treating a headache. But one of the important rules is that all rules are meant to be broken. So some people will present in a fairly unique way that others don't. The most common headaches are the tension and migraine headaches. And there's a significant overlap in those headaches too. A lot of people have the uh, incorrect idea that the severity of the headache determines whether it's a migraine or not. Indeed, a lot of migraine headaches present without headache at all. We've all heard of the migraine aura. Auras are presentations of neurologic symptoms caused by the spreading depression of the, uh, let me get into my slides here. Hopefully you can see those. Um, spreading depression uh, of the, the brain, which depending on the location activates a variety of symptoms. The most classic of that is the visual aura. And visual auras can be the scintillating scotomata, which is a fortification spectra, lights zigzag lines. These are called positive phenomena in the visual uh, aura, but there can also be negative ones where there's a loss of vision a diminution of vision, wavy lines. But migraine aura can also present with dizziness, with nausea, uh, neurologic symptoms of numbness or tingling, weakness. And then may or may not be followed by a headache. So you have some patients who have aura and don't have headache. So 
in the intensity spectrum, you know, it, it, it's not just how bad a headache is that determines the migraine. Not a lot of my migraine patients saying, oh, it wasn't a migraine because it wasn't severe or it didn't cause my nausea and vomiting. The um, tension headaches are very common headaches and they will cause a uh, generally a band-like discomfort around the head. These are typically not associated with aura or other neurologic symptoms, but can cause significant uh, loss of time involved in work and school, enjoyment of life. The um, Well, considered benign, again, if you're losing time at work, if you're unable to enjoy your life and participate in, in uh, daily activities, it really impacts your life. Chronic stress has often been associated with uh, tension headaches. Um, when people approach a headache to treat it, it's important to recognize whether or not it's a tension headache, whether it's a migraine headache, or very commonly a mixed headache syndrome. Now, a mixed headache syndrome can occur for a variety of conditions. So for instance, patients who have chronic frequent headaches may start to overuse painkillers. So excessive non-steroidal use uh, or Tylenol use, or in many cases, narcotics can lead to excessive rebound headaches. Oftentimes caffeine is, is used and can also cause uh, rebound headaches due to caffeine, caffeine abuse. The um, mixed headaches can also be due to headaches that are caused by conditions in the paracranial area. So for instance, TMJ, which is a dislocation of the jaw joint, can cause pain in the side of the head. And that can cause what is perceived as a headache. Degenerative joint and disc disease in the cervical spine can cause neck pain, which frequently radiates up into the head. Sinus disease can cause pain in the head. Glaucoma can cause eye pain. Quite often, patients who suffer headache syndromes will have headaches generated from one of these conditions, which then can turn into migraines if you are prone to headaches. Migraines with aura can be associated with a higher risk of stroke, and you actually see a higher uh, occurrence of PFO in those patients. Um, you will also see uh, stroke at a higher incidence in migraine patients when they have aura and they smoke and they use birth control pills. How you manage a headache depends on a number of conditions. The severity of the headache, the frequency of the headache, and its impact on your life. So for instance, I have a, a patient who twice a year has a severe headache goes on for a week and she has stroke-like symptoms. So she's severely weak on one side of her body. She gets admitted to the hospital. She goes through extensive testing and of course they never find anything. Even though these headaches only occur twice a year, they are significantly disabling. So how you treat a headache depends on not only the frequency and severity, but also its impact on life. In a woman like this, it would be important to put her on a daily medicine to prevent her headaches. How do you know when a headache is dangerous? Well, it's not the intensity of the headache, but it's often the pattern of headaches. So for instance, if someone has come to you and they've got a 20 year history of severe 
disabling headaches with nausea and vomiting and visual disturbances, that's probably a benign headache syndrome. But someone who comes to you who has never had a headache before and now has a new headache, that is a red flag. One has to be more aware of the possibility of secondary causes of headache. Let me get into my slides here. So migraines aren't just the headache, as I said. There is a phase before the headaches, which is called the pre-drum, pre and a phase after the headache, which is the post-drum. And these are also disabling. Here we have the premonitory phase of migraine, where for a day or two before the headache, Patients have fatigue, they have cognitive changes, they have sensory abnormalities. So they're already having some, in many cases, disabling symptoms before they even have the headache. They often don't recognize the headache is coming until it happens and they look back and they go, oh, yeah, this is what I feel before I get my, my headaches. These type of symptoms are usually caused by subcortical influences. This is a quick run through of some of the subcortical areas, the hypothalamus, the ventral medial nucleus, the A1 nucleus, the posterior hypothalamus, and the transmitters associated with it, which begin to bring out some of these symptoms that occur prior to the onset of headache. The postdrum, of course, is a period of time after the occurrence of headache. This is a, a slide that gives you an idea of the percentage of occurrence. And you can see by the numbers that a significant number of patients who suffer migraines, even when the headache is over, will have a development of other symptoms. And I'll make this next slide a little easier to read. You have neuropsychiatric changes with concentration difficulty, sleep disturbances, sensory light and sound difficulty with speaking, GI symptoms, tiredness, fatigue. So even when you've, you've resolved the headache, you still feel crummy. When you're evaluating a patient with headache syndromes, you, you have to ask certain questions. And, and I've touched on those in a moment, um, which were, you know, are you taking medication for your headache? And how often and how much are you taking? Because we have to think about the, the substance overuse rebound headaches. The same is true of caffeine. The overuse of caffeine can cause rebound headaches. You have patients who find that, you know, a couple aspirin and a cup of coffee gets rid of their headache because caffeine has vasoconstrictive properties, which really help. But excessive use of caffeine causes rebound headaches. And I, I've had patients come to me with intractable headaches. I had this one woman who came to me and she was saying, you know, it's funny, I, I don't get headaches in the winter, but every day in the summer, I get terrible headaches. I asked her what's going on in the summer. Well, eventually we got to the point that she brews her own home iced tea. And then she drinks a gallon of iced tea every day in the summer. So I said, this summer, you're not going to make your iced tea. And for the first time in 20 years, she did not have headaches in the summer. Now, hormones also play a, a big role in migraines, but that's a very variable thing. So your classic migrainer starts in puberty and ends in menopause. But then I've had other patients who start at menopause or get worse at menopause. Your classic migrainer stops having headaches during pregnancy, but then there's some that start in pregnancy. Birth control pills can cause migraines in some patients, but in other patients who have frequent severe headaches because their internal hormones are all over the place, the birth control calms that down and improves their migraines. So in each case, you see hormones play a role, but it's not always predictable, but it's important to notice that. I frequently have patients who come to me in their 40s and 50s and they're having worsening headaches. And it's because they're in that decade of perimenopausal symptom. So it's important to understand, you know, the effect of hormones on headaches. So when do you get concerned. When do you decide that you have to do an imaging study on a patient? Well, first and foremost, if it's a new onset headache, if you've never had these type of headaches before, you should always image a patient. 
You should also image a patient when there's a change in the type or the frequency of the headache, or if there are worrisome symptoms that are just not explained. Uh, let's see. There are a variety of treatments in headache. And this is a very extensive list, which might be hard to read. When I treat a patient, I use what's called the step approach. Step approach means start with the simplest things. If two Tylenol and a cup of coffee gets rid of your headache, you don't need anything more than that. But usually patients coming to my office have a more severe headache and have already tried over the counter medicines. So we then step up into other medications. Obviously there's prescription non-steroidals, but you don't wanna use those frequently. You know, obviously they have a lot of GI side effects. None of the medicines should be used frequently. You know, you're using these for the intermittent occurrence of headaches. We have the various triptans, we have the ergotamines, combination medications. Opioids, I would say generally avoid in most migraine syndromes. I've been to a variety of headache talks I've asked experts in the field, when do you use opiates in headaches? And their unanimous answer was never. Uh, a lot of patients become addicted or start to abuse opiates. So when you're assessing a patient's response to treatment, well, I tell people, you should imagine your medicines like Goldilocks and the three bears. This one's too hot, this one's too cold, this one's just right. Well, what is just right? Your headache is gone, it's gone completely. It's gone quickly within an hour and there are no unpleasant side effects. So if you have less than that, if your headache lessens but persists throughout the day or if it goes away and comes back or you have unpleasant side effects with the medication, then, then none of those are acceptable. But you have to understand we're, we're trying to manage a headache syndrome that's going to be going on for perhaps the majority of your life. A lot of my patients who suffer chronic headaches, I jokingly made up something I call the Woody Allen syndrome. As Woody Allen once said in a movie that life was divided into the horrible and the miserable. He said the horrible is when the Nazis break into your house and take your family away and kill them all. So be happy or miserable. And that's really a lot how a lot of headache patients are. They have the terrible, terrible migraine headache. They're in bed. They're vomiting. They can't get out of a dark room. They can't get to work. That's their horrible headache. So they're happy to have a miserable headache where they can get to work and be uncomfortable all day. And many patients have accepted that as a way to live, but that's not a way to live. When I get a patient like that, and I correctly treat their headache syndrome, they come back to me amazed because I've changed their lives. They said, you know, for 20 years, I've had these terrible headaches. I've not been able to go out with my family to the movies, to dinner. You know, I can't hold a job. It's like now for the first time in my life, I'm headache free. So here's our opportunity to really make a difference in people's lives. This is just going over what I've just said, really. Uh, if you look at a headache treatment, okay, initially no response to a treatment, well, is it because you have an inadequate dose? For instance, sumatriptan, it, it, it came in a 25 milligram, a 50 milligram, and a 100 milligram dose. I don't know why they even made the 25 milligram dose because it almost never works. I've had a lot of patients come to me and say, I've tried that drug, it doesn't work. I find out they've been on 25 milligrams. It's like, well, it almost never does work at that dose. So make sure that you have an adequate dose. Make sure that the patient takes the medicine early in the headache. While that is something that they often tell a patient, also tell them that you can take it at any time in the headache. I've had a lot of patients say, well, I missed the beginning, so I didn't take the medicine because they said you have to take it in the beginning. No, take it any time. But it's most effective if you take it early on. The route of administration is important to consider because if I start vomiting early on, where's that pill going? It's not going in your system, it's going out. So sometimes you have to consider that. If, if they're vomiting as an early presentation, consider alternate methods, nasal spray or the injectable form. The injectable form 
is especially helpful in the wake up headaches because patients wake up already in an intense headache. You've kind of missed your early opportunity. So the injectable headache gets in is more bioavailable. It's quicker acting. So they say ensure a second dose is taken. Yes, after two hours of a triptan, you may take a second dose. And that's fine and you should do that. Though I always say that my first criteria is that my headache is gone before then. So I would try to find an alternate treatment. Oh, sorry. Um, if there's inconsistent response, again, either a higher dose or an alternate medicine should be used. And avoid the overuse you know, phenomenon. Patients will frequently start to take excess, extra medicine. Um, if you find that they're taking extra medicine all the time, then we need to talk about preventive medicines. So the ones we've just talked about are the abortives. For the preventatives, there's a huge variety of medications out there that are used from blood pressure medicines, to seizure medicines, to antidepressants, non-steroidals, ergots. The choice, again, depends on the patient. So propanolol was one that was commonly used for many years and still is used. It's a beta blocker, it's a blood pressure medicine. So it's a very effective drug in preventing headaches, however, you shouldn't give it to someone who has poorly controlled asthma. You shouldn't give it to someone who has hypotension or bradycardia. So you have to pick and choose your choice. Topiramate, which is an epilepsy medicine, uh, I find that very effective in preventing migraines. However, it causes cognitive side effects in some people. And if you have a problem with kidney stones, you probably don't want to use that. There's a rare effect on the vision. So patients who have visual issues, you might want to avoid it there. You know, the antidepressants, the tricyclic antidepressants are very effective in, in preventing headaches. But once again, they you know, have mood issues, they have weight gain issues, fatigue issues. So each patient you have to kind of pick and choose, you know, which drug is right for that patient. Age has something to do with it too. So, you know, some of the tricyclics you probably don't want to use for the uh, anticholinergic effect in elderly patients. And this goes over that into some detail, you know, beta blockers, the exercise intolerance, orthostasis, you know, nephrolithiasis. So these are all just things I've mentioned right now as far as considerations about those medicines. Let's see. When you use the triptans, which are very effective uh, drugs, uh, there are certain avoidances there too. So if someone has vascular disease, specifically they have had strokes or coronary artery disease, they, that is a time you can't use those. When you fail your acute treatment, that's when it's time to consider transitioning to the chronic medications. I've mentioned in that list, a variety of medications. More recently, there is a new class of medications called the CGRP inhibitors. And I'm really a fan of these medications because I've been using them on patients who have failed a wide variety of these other medications and have sound, found great success in the uh, use of this. So CGRP inhibitor is a once a month injection uh, and is very effective in controlling headaches. So when you're assessing your response to treatment, as I've said, is one issue is the, the medicine you're picking and, and the dose of the medicine. But you may have failures because you've not corrected, correctly diagnosed the type of headache you have. Uh, you may have side effects that limit the patient's uh, willingness to take the medicine. So you have to listen to the patient and, and understand you know, why they may not be taking medicine. A lot of headache patients, as I said before, they kind of only pay attention to their bad headaches. They, they don't listen to their lesser headaches. They also don't often realize 
about the post drum, the, the prodrome, and other symptoms that are part of a headache. So you want to do them, do a diary. I tell people to do a headache diary because that will help them start to realize. You know, they'll, tell, they'll come to me initially and say, oh, I only get two or three days of migraine a month. And then they do a diary and they discover they have 15 days of headache, maybe two or three severe headache days, but several days of, of headache. And maybe they also have days in which they have sensitivity to light and nausea and difficulty concentrating. And, and you try and make them understand that this is all part of the migraine syndrome. So that once you assess the frequency, the severity, the associated symptoms and the impact on their life, you, you may be able to better convince them to be on a preventative medicine. There are a variety of triggers also when you, when you have patients with migraine headaches. Uh, surprisingly, there are things that cause headaches. I mean, we've touched on caffeine overuse, we've talked, touched on rebound headaches due to medication overuse. But then there are some unique triggers uh, in migraine. And you have things you eat, things you drink, and even things you smell that can provoke a, a migraine in sensitive patients. This isn't true of all migraineurs, but classically mentioned triggers include wine, chocolate, nuts, MSG, which is in Chinese food, but in Doritos as well, nitrates, which are in hot dogs, bacon, processed meats. And I'll have a patient do a diary and discover, well, every time I eat a hot dog, I get a headache. Well, obviously, if you discover you have a trigger, avoiding the trigger is important. Some triggers are very elusive. I had a woman who, who did a diary and, and discovered she would only get her migraines when a particular temporary worker came to her job. And it was that woman's perfume that was the cause. Some triggers you can control, others not so much. Barometric pressure changes, for instance, can, can do it. All right, um, so that is the most common headaches though, the tension headaches, the migraine headaches. And as I said, understanding those, uh, you'll probably make the biggest impact on your patient's life. I'm now going to go into headache types, which are still considered primary headache types, but these have oftentimes underlying medical conditions associated with them. The first is the low pressure headache. So if you have a decrease in the spinal fluid pressure, uh, this can cause a severe headache. Of course, we're all familiar with uh, the post lumbar puncture headache. You know, patients had to withdraw the CSF, the pressure drops, they have a severe headache. Uh, this is often recognized as being a positional headache. If the patient lays down, the headache improves. If they stand up, it gets worse. In severe cases, nausea and vomiting occur. But they can also occur spontaneously. So in patients who are older that have degenerative disc disease in the spine, it can sometimes lead to dural tears, which leads to spinal fluid. Of course, patients who have had prior trauma or surgery to the neck or epidural injections uh, can all lead to a leakage of the CSF, which then causes severe headaches. One of the ways you can assess that, of course, is in your office, if you put them in the Trend Ellenberg position and you see a remarkable improvement in the headache. Both high and low pressure headaches can cause a variety of neurologic symptoms, such as a six nerve palsy or tinnitus or hearing loss, dizziness, neck or back pain. When you have these types of headaches, it's important to do imaging studies. The low pressure headache can result in intracranial bleeding, such as a subdural or subarachnoid hemorrhage. You may see a descent of the cerebellum or flattening of the anterior pons on the MRI. This, uh, this table here contrasts low pressure and high pressure headaches. Now the High pressure headaches are more typically seen in the younger age, typically under the age of 50. And of course, we've all heard about, you know, three Fs, a female woman who is overweight and in, in the fertile range. Um, these headaches can be very severe. 
And it's critical to recognize this syndrome because elevated spinal fluid pressure can lead to permanent visual loss. So whenever a patient presents to me, especially a young woman with severe headaches, I always look in their fundi to look for papilledema. Generally imaging on these cases are normal, though with prolonged uh, papilledema or prolonged uh, increased pressure, you may see an empty cella. When you do a spinal tap on these headaches, you'll usually see a, a significantly elevated opening pressure greater than 25. Contrast that with the low pressure headaches where you'll have a fairly low pressure and probably make the headache worse by doing the spinal tap. The headaches are positional. As we've said, in the low pressure headache, lying the patient down, it will probably improve the headache. But if you do that to a high pressure headache, it's probably going to get it much worse. If they are in airplanes, you'll often complain of worsening headache when they're, when they're in high altitude. One of the signs of high pressure headache also is if you bend down and stand up again, you might have transient visible loss. So, When you have a patient coming in with severe headache and papilledema, you should consider besides obviously doing the spinal tap and you discover that the patient does have high pressure, you should place them on acetazolamide, which has been very helpful in reducing the intracranial pressure. However, if visual loss occurs, they're likely going to need a procedure, most common of those being the optic nerve fenestration, though VP shunt has also been used. Venous sinus stent and temporary lumbar drain are also used, but less commonly used. Comparing them, this is, uh, as I just was going on about it, the ventricular size is normal in both. Tonsillar descent is possible in both. The flattening of the pons is more common in the low pressure headache. And of course, opening pressure is high on intracranial hypertension and, and low on uh, hypotension. When you have a patient with uh, low pressure headache, obviously you want to look for the leak. Uh, quite often blood patching can be an effective way of controlling this headache. So if you can demonstrate a CSF leak and you can approach it, that's useful. Um, talked about some of the MRI changes. Uh, causes, uh, very commonly you'll see this in patients with uh, Marfan syndrome or Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, a variety of other conditions. So joint hypermobility, the kid who does the party tricks and bends his elbow backwards. Uh, this can lead to retinal deformity at a young age. And oops, come back here. Uh, yeah, and uh, we've mentioned, you know, lumbar puncture, surgery, trauma, that can all be causes uh, of, of low pressure headaches. Causes of pseudotumor cerebri, uh, cerebral venous sinus thrombosis or jugular vein obstruction, uh, cardiac issues, uh, and a variety of medications that you take, tetracycline and the fluoroquinolones are among them, vitamin A. Interestingly, we once had a patient come into the office who was an Eskimo who had severe headaches. Turns out that up in the Eskimo world, they were eating polar bear liver, which is very high in vitamin A. So obviously, make sure your patients aren't having a heavy diet of polar bear liver uh, if they're having this type of headaches. Withdrawal from steroids, use of steroids, lithium, a variety of other medicines, a very rare endocrinological issues uh, can also be associated with pseudotumorous cerebri. All right, going into the next class of headaches is the autonomic cephalgias. The most common of those that you're familiar with is cluster headache. They're called autonomic cephalgias because they have activation of the trigeminovascular system, the hypothalamus, the autonomic system, and you'll frequently see lacrimation, uh, conjunctival injection, nasal congestion, rhinorrhea associated with it, usually a unilateral headache with those symptoms on the same site. 
So cluster headache is the most common of those. And unlike migraine, which is more typically seen in, in women, though present in both, cluster migraines are three to one male predominance, and usually younger men between the ages of 20 to 40. Now, cluster migraines are typically episodic and frequently circadian in their occurrence. So a patient may have a headache in the spring. It may go on for several weeks and then resolve. And then next spring, they have it again. Frequently patients have incorrectly thought they have sinus headaches because it's occurring in the springtime. Uh, classic features of the cluster migraine is the unilateral pain and the associated autonomic symptoms. The pain itself can last anywhere from 15 minutes to a couple hours, and usually is one to you know seven or eight times a day. The cluster itself is a daily headache that goes on for anywhere from six to 12 weeks. It comes on abruptly and can go away just as quickly. One of the hallmarks of cluster migraine is that drinking alcohol during the cluster significantly worsens the headache does not affect you, doesn't cause a headache when you're not in the cluster. Unlike migraineurs who like to go into a dark room and lay down and put their head under a pillow, patients with cluster headaches are like a bull in a china shop. They gotta run around, they wanna put their head through a wall. They're very anxious and restless. So common treatments for migraine are often ineffective in cluster headaches. So it's important to recognize a cluster headache when you see it. If you happen to be in the clinic where you have high flow oxygen and the patient is having a headache at that moment, you may be able to resolve that headache. Same is true of the uh, injectable, injectable sumatriptan, which has been very helpful. But the problem is that the headache's gonna keep coming back. So it only helps temporarily. So in those patients, you usually start with giving them a course of steroids which will control the cluster and then place them on a preventative as well. And most commonly effective found to be useful is verapamil. The short acting version 83 times a day is more effective than the long acting version. There have been reports that topamax can be helpful, melatonin can be helpful, lithium can be helpful, but verapamil has, and, and steroids are really the mainstay of management here. The autonomic cephalogies also include paroxysmal hemicrania, which unlike the cluster, the cluster typically is more of a frontotemporal headache. The hemicrania is of course the entire one side. These also have frequent occurrences of headaches but are not circadian like the cluster headache. So you don't get the anniversary headache next year. Rather you get a fairly frequent occurrence of headaches, usually more five or more a day they last two to 30 minutes. These headaches, the hemicranias, are not really effective or responsive to classic migraine treatment, but are exquisitely responsive to endomethacin. The paroxysmal hemicrania, of course, is, as I said, a headache that comes and goes. Contrast that with hemicrania continua, which is a continuous pain. Both respond to endomethacin, however. They is some autonomic symptoms with the hemicranial continuum, but it's not as prominent as with the paroxysmal. And then finally is the short unilateral neurologic form headaches often associated with autonomic, tra trigeminal autonomic symptoms, which is the sunct and the suna. These are slightly older age, usually 40 to 70 year old patients with very brief attacks of pain. It can be as little as a second, but usually up to about a minute. These can be a hundred times a day and are very sensitive to tactile stimulation. So just touching a particular area can set it off. With the cluster migraines, you'll often see that to some degree also. So my patients with cluster headaches will often notice that, you know, touching an area may, might, might provoke it. With the Sunkt and Suna, uh, they're more responsive to lamotrigine or IV lidocaine.
And this is just going through the diagnostic criteria, which we've just gone over. Um, paroxysmal hemicrania, again, which we've just gone over. And now let's go into the neuralgias. The cranial neuralgias are painful conditions due to involvement of a sensory cranial nerve. So any sensory cranial nerve can cause pain. The classic ones, of course, are the trigeminal and the occipital neuralgias. These are most commonly due to some type of compression, mostly due to a vascular loop. For this reason, it is critical when you see a patient with this type of condition to do imaging studies. You may see a vascular loop. Other compressions can be due to neoplasm. It has been seen in posterior fossa AVMs. It is not uncommon in demyelinating conditions. So I have several multiple sclerosis patients who have this condition. Of course, neurologists can also be associated with uh, herpes outbreaks. So you have post-herpetic neurologists, though that's not limited to the cranial nerves. The most common, of course, is the trigeminal neuralgia, which causes recurrent unilateral brief pain, usually 10 seconds to up to two minutes with again, an abrupt onset and abrupt offset of severe pain. It is limited to the distribution of a branch of the fifth cranial nerve. So when patients come to me and the doctor says they've had trigeminal neurology, I say, where's the pain? Oh, it's here, it's here, it's back there, it's over here. It's like, that's not a cranial neurology, obviously. It's limited to the distribution of the trigeminal nerve. So you know that that has three distributions, number one, number two, number three. It can be one, it can be two contiguous areas. These patients often have pain triggered by innocuous stimuli. So even cold air blowing on their face can set off an attack. Patients say they no longer brush their teeth because it causes an attack. They can't comb their hair. They can't drink hot or cold liquid because it'll cause a severe attack. So again, electric shock-like severe intensity um, typically, you know, as I said, the MRI may or may not show a, a, a neurovascular compression. Treatment starts with the, the uh, anticonvulsant therapies such as carbamazepine, oxcarbazepine, gabapentin, or even the trisulfic antidepressants can have some benefit. Um, in patients, however, who are recalcitrant to treatment, surgical approach may be necessary gamma knife or more commonly and more effective is the microvascular decompression. Let's see here. Now, those are primary headache syndromes. I now wanted to get into the second half of my talk, which is the uh, secondary headaches. And these are important to recognize because a potential serious underlying cause is much more likely. So right here, there's a mnemonic, mnemonic called SNOOP. It is helpful in, in going through a list to see what, what you know, could be a secondary cause. So SNOOP, S, systemic symptoms, fever, chills, rash, night sweats, weight loss, other issues, you know, HIV or other immunocompromised state or history of malignancy, pregnancy or postpartum issues, right? Neurologic signs or symptoms, change in mental status, diplopia, other cranial nerves or other focal neurologic issues, history of seizures, sudden onset. So you've never had this headache before and bang, you've got the worst headache of your life. Age, older age of onset of severe headaches is always a red flag. And then pattern changes. So I might have a patient who has a chronic history of headaches and all of a sudden I've never had this type of headache before. I've never had it behave in this way before. Uh, there's something different about this headache. These are the red flags that make you want to go, okay, we have to start imaging these patients. I just want to touch on various causes because I see we're running out of time. So for instance, neoplasms. Interestingly enough, tumors often don't cause headaches or they may be just mild to moderate headaches, but there are certain features with those. They, they can worsen with positional change or exertion. Um, they usually cause their headache because of traction on uh, vascular structures or connective tissue structures within the brain. Vascular disorders, of course, we just talked about the worst headache of your life. That should always be a trigger to think about 
subarachnoid hemorrhage. You'll often see meningismus symptoms, neck stiffness, but there'll be no fever associated with that. 50% um, of patients with subarachnoid hemorrhage will have a earlier mild headache, which is the sentinel bleed. So depending on the location of the bleed, you could have focal neurologic symptoms. Anybody who presents like this urgently needs a CAT scan of the head to look for acute bleeding. However, that can be negative. It's been improving over the years, but up to 15% of CTs may fail to show the acute bleed, which means that if you're really suspecting a subarachnoid hemorrhage and the CT is negative, you need to do a lumbar puncture. When you do a lumbar puncture, well, when I was in my, my training, we would had a, a, a centrifuge. So if you did a traumatic tap and the blood came, CSF came out, it should be white, you know, not white, it should be clear as water. Uh, if it's tinged, you could spin it down. If it was acute blood, it would all settle to the bottom and it would be clear. Not everybody has a centrifuge with them. So the other thing you can do is send the tubes one and four, because if you did a traumatic tap, you'll see a lot of blood in tube one and then much less in tube four. Obviously, it's very critical to start doing imaging, MRA or CTA, to look for aneurysm in these cases. Other vascular headaches can include the subdural headache, but usually that is a more insidious onset and oftentimes presents with a change in mental status in elderly patients who didn't recognize due to dementia or other reasons that they'd had some type of trauma. Every now and then you'll have headaches present to you in a younger person often with arterial dissection. Uh, this can be due to trauma, but sometimes even a violent sneeze can cause a dissection of an artery, typically causing a unilateral headache, often the complaint of tearing pain up the back of my head or even facial pain, depending on where it is. A carotid dissection may cause a horner, horner syndrome, kind of a posterior vertebral may cause a uh, amaurosis fugax. So those are red flags there. Interestingly enough, ischemic stroke rarely causes headaches, but about 25% of the patients will have some degree of headache. A rare cause of headaches in vascular issues is the cerebral venous sinus thrombosis. That's important to look, you know, because it could cause hemorrhage from vascular congestion. You may see papilledema in those patients, but they may present with altered mental status, focal neurologic symptoms, or even seizures. This is especially occurring in young women in the peripartum state or who have newly been placed on high estrogen birth control pills. So again, you have to look at the whole picture here. Once in a while, and I've seen this a handful of times in my, in my career, is the reverse, reversible cerebral vasoconstriction syndrome, which causes recurrent severe headache attacks. This is due to diffuse segmental constriction of intracranial arteries. And about half of those patients might present with focal neurologic symptoms uh, or seizures, and imaging may even show watershed strokes. Arterial hypertension, yeah, we've got a lot of patients come in with uh, uncontrolled blood pressure. The blood pressure is really high, like 190, 200, you might come in with blood pressure. That may be a benign cause, which improves with treatment of the blood pressure, but severe hypertension can provoke uh, encephalopathy, seizures, confusion. Inflammatory disorders, another group of headaches. Most commonly, you're gonna see things like giant cell arteritis. Remember, this is an older population. So patients usually 60 or over, but certainly don't think about it under the age of 50. If someone comes in with headaches and they're 25, don't think about general giant cell arteritis. This is on exam, you're gonna see a patient with tenderness in their temporal arteries. You may see induration of the artery and diminished pulse of the artery. It's important to recognize that because 50% of those patients can go blind due to ophthalmic artery involvement. This can be prevented with the use of steroids early on. Associated symptoms can be jaw claudication, weight loss, general malaise, myalgia, and you should check this right away if you're suspecting this by checking out a sed rate and a C-reactive protein. I caution you the sed rate, if you draw it in the hospital and they let it sit on the table for on a couple hours, it may be artificially low. So the C-reactive protein is a little more uh, reliable. And then obviously if the suspicion is high, if that those numbers are high, you wanna do a temporal artery biopsy. Uh, remember that there are what they call skip lesions. So if they, your surgeon only does one small biopsy, he may miss the area. Therefore they usually do multiple segments to see about that. A rare inflammatory disorder 
is Telosa Hunt syndrome, again, causing severe unilateral, typically periorbital pain, pain painful ophthalmoplegia. Uh, this is a relapsing or remitting condition that can go on for months or years. This is usually in a younger person, around 40s. Uh, you may see on imaging nonspecific inflammation in the cavernous sinus or superior orbital fissure. Again, this is treated with steroids. Infections can be causes of headache. Just a general febrile illness can be a cause of general headache, but one has to always have their antenna up for headache and fever that has meningeal signs. If this is a presentation of bacterial meningitis, you should presumptively start them on antibiotics because the patient can die quickly from that. You know, you, you look for nuchal rigidity, Koenig Brzezinski signs, you do imaging studies, you do lumbar puncture, but you don't wait for the cultures to come back in two days because they'll be dead by then. Finally, trauma is a very common cause of headaches in patients. Uh, usually the younger patients with concussions are gonna they be the ones that come on and those are gonna be within seven days of trauma. Uh, doesn't have to be a severe trauma. Sometimes it can be a minor trauma, um, but you will have a compendium of symptoms besides headache, dizziness, fatigue, cognitive complaints, anxiety, insomnia, even personality changes. These are often very effective to some of the comic, common um, preventatives like the tricyclic antidepressants. Uh, other traumas, surgical traumas, postcraniotomy. Post you can see about two thirds of the patients uh, with postcraniotomy can have pain as a result of, of that trauma to their head, often very responsive to uh, gabapentin. All right, I mean, I can go on forever, but we're running out of time. Uh, so I'm gonna open it up to questions here. And Brian, thank you very much. That was a great overview. And uh, as I said, we also, we also have students joining. So I, I, I'm sure that this was great. We do have several questions for you. Um, one question okay. is, um, for patients with chronic migraine headache who have also medication overuse headache, on average, how long after stopping the offending medication do their rebound headache start to improve? Well, um, I would say that could take a, a couple of weeks. And, and oftentimes, uh, sudden stopping of the offending medication will cause much worse headache. So okay. I typically taper it off, and it depends on how much they've been using uh, as to how long it takes to taper that off. Okay. Now you also, uh, there's another question. You briefly touched on the CGRP inhibitors and their effectiveness in controlling the headache. And uh, I'm actually gonna expand this question. Can you make a comment a little bit about the CGRP monoclonal antibodies as a prophylactic? You know, what, what, uh, uh, what can I say? And also CGRP antagonist as an abortive, you know, and, and uh, uh, you know, when should we consider these medications? Well, I think at this point in time, the CGRP inhibitors are a real game changer for a lot of people. Uh, and I would think that they should be used even primary. However, we have considerations of insurance companies refusing to pay for them early on. Typically, you have to fail two other types of abortives before they're willing to pay for that medicine. But I think it is a very safe drug, a very effective drug. And I can tell you in my own personal experience, I'm putting this on patients who have already failed at least three other abortives, who have frequent severe headaches that have been recalcitrant to treatment, and they get put on this and bang, you know, it's, it's an amazing response. So I see no reason that as time goes on and the insurance companies allow it, that that can be a first uh, approach to treatment. Now, those are the, the abortives. Um, the, uh, I'm sorry, the, that, those are the preventives. The abortives, the, the pills that are currently used, um, the benefit with those is that in the triptans, I mentioned before, you really can't use those in patients with vascular disease. No such problem occurs with the CGRP and uh, abortive, the pills that you can take to try and get rid of a headache. Now, one thing I didn't mention, also other treatments for headache, uh, Botox injections, I didn't touch on that. It's another thing. And, and neurostimulators, you know, there were various devices, vagal nerve stimulators, all of which are, are not widely available, but have some benefit in headaches. All right, go ahead. Okay. What are the, uh, another question, what are the common side effects you see with the CGRP inhibitors? Well, um, if you read the, uh, the, the, uh, literature on, on the CGRP inhibitors, because they're such a new class, 
Um, the only concern is injection site reactions, or they say, or allergy to the medicine, which of course no one's ever used before, so you wouldn't know you're allergic to it. I myself have not had uh, any complaints from patients uh, in taking this so far. So it's been really a, a pleasant uh, surprise to use these medicines. Another question is, can you make a, a little bit of a, a comment about what that basilar type migraine, how to uh, diagnose it and are there any, uh, is the treatment different, differs than the regular migraine? Well, I, people have, have gotten away from using that term um, because there's been uh, no proof on imaging studies that there really is a diminished blood flow in the basilar artery uh, in a lot of studies. Um, nonetheless, if patients are having um, stroke-like symptoms, uh, there are uh, avoidances. You know, you obviously would consider not using the triptans in that case. Um, and you obviously, again, going back to my talk, uh, look into what is the underlying cause there? Is it more just a common migraine syndrome? Uh, and if so, you know, would this patient, depending on the frequency and the severity of the occurrence, uh, be better served being put on one of these preventative medicines? Another question is, uh, migraine without aura, do we treat it or not? Uh, absolutely. Um, so I have, for instance, a patient who three times a month has a 45 minute disruption of vision. Mm -hmm. Okay. No headache. However, he's an airplane pilot, which is a problem, right? Mm -hmm. So it depends again on the impact of the aura on your life. So if some people say, you know, I get some flashing lights, some colors and 25 minutes later, it's gone. I don't have a headache no problem. Okay. You don't need to treat it. But in the case of the gentleman who's an airline pilot, he cannot afford to not be able to see for 45 minutes. So in such a case, yes, I'm going to place him on a preventative medication, not an abortive because, you know, it's already there. Once, once it's there, the abortive, you have to wait for it to work and hope that it works and he can't afford to do that. So again, it depends on the, the uh, nature of it and, and how much it, it impacts your life. Okay. And uh, another question for patients who have had a microvascular decompression, do you see them come back with headaches? And what is the best treatment for these headaches? So in a microvascular decompression, uh, one of the more common causes of headache is the low pressure headache afterwards because they've had surgery and they may have a CSF leak. So approaches to, to CSF leak headaches are certainly one of the, uh, the things you should consider. But yes, uh, unfortunately, there are some patients who do not respond as well as you can. Uh, obviously, you'd refer them back to the surgeon to see if there is anything in relation to the surgery and the decompression that can be improved, or will they respond to some of the oral medications? All right, and uh, it's nine o'clock, so we're going to stop here. But uh, Dr. Kelly, that was an uh, excellent talk. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, and uh, I would like uh, uh, to invite everybody to join for our next grand rounds. And uh, uh, next time, it's going to be on February 19, and Dr. Farmer will be talking about tremors. Thank you very much. Thank you.